Good afternoon. My name is Ethan Dimitrovsky, and I serve as provost here at uh, MD Anderson. It's really a, a wonderful personal pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Margaret Kripke, who's the chief scientific officer of CPRID, and a number of guests that she will um, introduce in but a, a moment. I wanted to just take a um, a moment to introduce Dr. Kripke, who is well known to our community because she is an emeritus faculty member here, a professor of immunology, and the former Vivian Smith chair um, at MD Anderson. She assumed the position of chair in the Department of Immunology at MD Anderson in 1983 and became our vice president for academic programs in 1998 and executive vice president and chief academic officer in 2001. In 2003, President Bush asked Dr. Kripke to become a member of the prestigious three-person three President's Cancer Panel, a group that advises the White House on the status and needs of the cancer problem in America, and she served in that role uh, until 2011. And in fact, that's the first time I met Dr. Kripke. I had the pleasure of testifying before her at the, at the President's Cancer Panel. In 2009, uh, she retired from MD Anderson, but uh, quickly found the life of retirement was not as appealing as uh, you had thought, perhaps, Dr. Kripke in advance, and then became our chief scientific officer of uh, CPRID. And we're just so fortunate to have uh, her here today, a number of guests that she'll um, introduce. And we're going to be discussing um, the um, computational biology, RFA, and, and other topics. Dr. Kripke. Thank you very much, Dr. Dmitrovsky. Um, I also want to thank MD Anderson for hosting us today and for all of the technical support that they've given us, uh, as well as the uh, IT team at CPRIT who has helped put this together, and of course, Michael Brown, whom I'll introduce in a minute. Um, before we begin our discussion of the computational biology RFA, I want to introduce the CEO of CPRIT, uh, who has an announcement to make to you today. Mr. Wayne Roberts is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of CPRID and has been since January of 2013, and he is the person most responsible for CPRID's survival following its troubles in 2012. Mr. Roberts. Thank, thank you, Margaret. I, we hadn't talked. I figured I'd go ahead and let you do this because um, um, she's put the fear of God in me about keeping this short, so I, I, really, I really will. The uh, exciting announcement today is we have publicly announced uh, that Dr. James Wilson of the Simmons Cancer Center, the director of the Simmons Cancer Center at Southwestern, uh, is going to be joining us on March 1st uh, as the new chief scientific officer. Uh, we are absolutely excited uh, that Dr. Wilson is going to be able to continue the the succession of really outstanding individuals to hold that position, and uh, really uh, hope that all of y'all will will welcome him. I'm I'm sure that you will. Uh, I also would like to uh, on the phone introduce uh, Dr. Bill Rice, a member of our oversight committee who uh, has actually taken a great amount of interest in today's topic uh, and has done considerable research of concerning. Uh, the uh, RFA and the applications the, for the first round on the computational uh, uh, program. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Margaret. Thanks so much, Margaret. Thank you so much. So Jim, welcome. Um, I'm delighted that uh, Jim is with us today. Um, I think his being here will help provide continuity for the program, so the things that you say to me today will get automatically transmitted to my successor, so I'm very grateful that you've taken the time to be here today, Jim. Um, I also want to introduce Michael Brown, who's been my uh, program director for the last three years, who is responsible for almost everything, putting everything together and does most of the work that I take credit for. Um, we also, as uh, Wayne said, have Dr. Bill Rice on the telephone, and Bill has been most interested in and very supportive of 
computational biology and really helped facilitate getting this on our priority list. And so Dr. Rice was unable to be here in person, but he's here on the phone to participate. And um, Dr. Rice actually read all of the reviewers' comments from the last round of applications and prepared a summary of uh, those comments, which we will present today at today's meeting. So Dr. Rice, thank you for your participation here. So the purpose of today's session is really twofold. First of all is to provide feedback to the applicants or potential, you know, potential applicants to this RFA. But second of all is to obtain some input from you on how we can improve the RFA and improve the process. So we want people to be successful in this uh, um, RFA for this, in this area because we are very interested in trying to help build this area of cancer research. So that's what we're doing here today. So um, the oversight committee, secret oversight committee adopted computational biology as a program priority in 2015. And so we tried to quickly put out an RFA for an individual investigator research award targeted for computational biology. Uh, the purpose of this award is to develop innovative mathematical and computational research projects to help people develop descriptive mathematical models of cancer as well as mechanistic models of cellular processes and interactions to build new tools for mining cancer research and treatment databases and perhaps most importantly to create partnerships between computational scientists, cancer biologists, and oncologists. Some examples of the types of projects that we anticipated uh, coming in are um, shown here. And I'm not going to read you everything on this list. This is taken directly from the RFA, and so it's represented there. But um, things like uh, projects that will help identify subjects at risk of developing cancer, um, in silico models of cancer development, new methodologies for clinical trial design, modeling of cancer cell signaling systems. These are the kinds of projects that we envisioned people would apply for. So what happened during the first round of applications? Well, 50 applications were submitted. To my great surprise, I did not really anticipate that we would have more than a handful of applications in this area. And we were very delighted uh, at the number that we received. Uh, you should know that all of the applications that came in for this RFA had a full review. That means that three reviewers reviewed every application. There was no triage. They were not subjected to any kind of a triage process. They were all reviewed. Um, 13 of those applications had a high enough score so that they were discussed at the peer review meetings. And the scores for all of the applications ranged from a 2.1 to a 9.0. Um, unfortunately, only one of the applications was funded. Of course, it's the one that got the score of 2.1. Uh, but there were two or three other ones that were very close to the cutoff scores for the various panels. So I wanted to make sure that, that um, we discussed what did the peer reviewers say about these grants? What were the, the major criticisms of these grants? And again, I'll thank Dr. Rice for compiling this. First of all, the review criterion of collaboration was a major issue in the reviews. The question that's asked of the reviewers is, does the applicant investigator demonstrate the required expertise to make a significant contribution in both mathematics and oncology, or are there appropriate collaborators or consultants with expertise in oncology or cancer biology? And one of the, some of the comments, the comments that came back from the review of these applications showed that 32% of the applications, a th roughly a third of the applications, were criticized because they lacked biological or clinical expertise. And these are some of the specific comments just taken randomly from individual grants. For example, there wasn't enough information about the collaborators. What were they going to do? What was their role in the project? There were 
one, one application said there were no clinicians or computational biologists listed, listed in the application. Um, one said there were no biological collaborators to help interpret the results, and no pathologists or biostatistician listed in some grants, and there was not a clear level of effort specified for some of the collaborators. Um, so the, the issue of having collaborators who understand the biological aspect of the project that's being carried out or the clinical aspect is really important. I'll give you one, one example from, from uh, things that I saw. Um, there was a lovely application that proposed studying a type of cancer and looking at um, the primary tumor to assess the um, characteristics of cells within the primary tumor and how many had metastatic potential as an, as an um, uh, prognostic indicator for being able to tell whether a cancer was going to metastasize or not. The problem was that the project was proposed for pancreatic cancer, where almost all of the patients who come in for diagnosis at the time of diagnosis already have metastases. So it's a great project. It's the wrong cancer model. And so there were uh, examples of this kind where clinical input or biological input is really critical because the mathematics is great, but the biological problem needs more input from people with the appropriate expertise. Another um, major area of concern had to do with preliminary data. And the question, again, that's asked of the reviewers is, does the proposed research have a clearly defined hypothesis or goal that is supported by sufficient preliminary data and or scientific rationale. And here, uh, nearly 40 percent of the applications had comments, the reviewers commented that there was very little or no preliminary data, and the lack of preliminary data made it very difficult to assess the significance of the project. Um, there were some comments about no data on modeling, the data that were presented were not very compelling, um, there were some of the uh, applications were lacking in, in a plan for how the data were going to be gathered and so on. And so that was another really major criticism. And then there were some other common themes that ran through the, these applications. Some of the uh, proposals were thought to be in areas of research that really were, were well investigated and adding a computational biology component to it wouldn't really advance the field particularly. Um, in some studies, tumor heterogeneity was not addressed, and again, um, we have to remember that when we take a primary tumor and look at cells within the primary tumor, um, when you do a biopsy, you're only getting a small sample of what's in the tumor, and there may be much more heterogeneity among the tumor cells. Also, within tumors, there are a lot of normal cell components, and so when you look at what's in a tumor, you're looking at both the normal cellular content as well as tumor cells, and those are intermixed. And if you're only looking at DNA, you can't distinguish whether the DNA is coming from normal cells or tumor cells. So that's what I think is meant by the issue of tumor heterogeneity is not, uh, was not addressed. And then, uh, again, failure to demonstrate a real understanding of cancer biology, uh, weak scientific approaches, or um, this one, I think, is very important. Also, a low or unclear impact on cancer prevention, diagnosis, or treatment. Again, might be the best uh, mathematical model, uh, might be the best um, uh, computational uh, project, but if it doesn't have an impact, if you can't demonstrate that it's going to have an impact on prevention or diagnosis or treatment, um, then it's you know, may not be worth doing in the terms of what CPRO is interested in funding. Okay, so that's um, some examples of the, the comments. Um, the projects really need to make sense from a clinical or biological uh, perspective. Now, some conclusions from, from that. Uh, it's very important that 
new and innovative ideas are being proposed here. We don't want to do a sophisticated analysis of something that is already known or will provide incremental information. Second, collaboration, I think, is really essential for a successful application. Some of the reviews said, or it, during the review process, people said, gee, this person has a collaborator who's very well qualified, but they don't say what the collaborator is going to do. And it's clear that the collaborator hasn't actually read the, uh, or read the proposal, because biologically there are some flaws or errors in it that would have been picked up if this person had actually reviewed the application. So that's uh, the collaboration part. It, says, it actually says in the RFA that we strongly urge you to have a, an appropriate collaborators to participate in the project. Um, obviously, from the reviewers' comments, preliminary data, some meaningful preliminary data should be presented. I think the original RFA said um, it wasn't absolutely necessary to have preliminary data, but clearly from the reviewers' comments, we, I think we will take that out of the, the RFA going forward. That preliminary data is probably one of the ways that the reviewers are able to assess whether this is going to make sense or, uh, or be uh, impactful in the end. And then the other recommendation is to thoroughly explain the concept and how it will make a difference in cancer research treatment or prevention. So those are the suggestions that we have gleaned from going through the reviewer comments and from sitting through the, the reviewers' um, uh, discussions. Now, um, so I think the, the comments about preliminary data is partly our fault because we didn't you know, urge people strongly to you know, say that you actually have to have preliminary data. And so um, I think that was partly misleading on our part because the reviewers uh, really disagreed with that and really wanted to see preliminary data. So that will be <clears throat> important going forward. Now, we also, um, at the conclusion of, of all of the peer review panel meetings, we ask the reviewers if they have any suggestions. What suggestions do they have? And particularly since this was a new mechanism, we were particularly interested in getting their specific feedback about this RFA. And so they did have a number of concerns that were expressed among the reviewers. Uh, one is they had to question did the RFA really clearly explain the purpose? Because in a lot of cases, they didn't see that people had clearly explained what they were doing. So we will go carefully through the RFA. What we are doing about that is we were having our reviewers, who are the people, the experts in this area, actually look at the RFA before it comes back out again. And so we're trying to get additional input uh, on that point before we release the next RFA. Uh, the second was there was a feeling, even among the reviewers, that there was an insufficient depth of expertise among the reviewers. And although every review panel had two or three people who were expert in this area, it's such a broad area that there, you know, uh, people who were, were added to the panels to cover this area uh, may have been experts in in uh, genomic analysis and dealing with large set data sets when the project, there were projects that were dealing with different areas. And so they may not have had, felt like they had the appropriate expertise to cover all of the areas. Um, what we will do there is, again, add additional people to the review panels, uh, bring them in ad hoc if we need to, to actually bolster that area so that we can really make sure that we have appropriate review for the applications. And for this, I will ask the help of the people in the audience. I personally do not necessarily know who all the experts are in these fields. Um, some of our the chairs of our review panels also don't, don't necessarily know who these people are. So we would welcome your suggestions for people to sit on the review panels. Please send us your suggestions. We will vet them and, may, and see, make sure that they have the appropriate stature and qualifications to serve as reviewers. Also remember that they have to be from out of state. Um, but uh, we would welcome any help that you can give us in that area would be most welcome. And then the third discussion that occurred was about the funding level and whether it was a sufficient amount of funding. And there seemed to be a sentiment among the reviewers that um, 
if you wanted to do a demonstration project using the uh, data that you had collected or using the model that you had built, that there wasn't really enough money in the uh, RFA to do a demonstration project. And so um, I would love to hear your comments about that. I can show you what we are proposing, but again, this has not been released yet, has not been carved in stone yet, and so if you have an opinion about that, we would love to hear it. What we are proposing is that applicants may request a maximum of $150,000 a year in total cost per year for up to three years. That's what the RFA said originally. But we want to add that investigators proposing a demonstration project may request an additional $150,000 in cost, total costs per year during the years in which a demonstration project takes place. Now, you tell me whether that makes any sense or not when we get to the discussion period, but that's what we are proposing at the moment. Okay, um, we have some, some housekeeping issues and some uh, things that we want to tell you as the new RFA comes out, and I'm going to ask Michael Brown to go over the next couple of slides, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. And this will be done very, very quickly. Um, as in most RFAs that we release, a PI may only submit one new or one resubmission application. Applications that are resubmitted can only be resubmitted one time uh, to be eligible. Um, a PI may submit an application for only one IRA me mechanism during each round. We will be releasing the other my IRA mechanisms, the untargeted, the childhood and adolescent cancer, and also the prevention and early detection. Uh, along with a couple of other RFAs. Um, any PI that has three or more secret grants that will be active on December 1st, 2016, they will not be eligible to apply for um, one, of these, um, RF, one, of, one of these RFAs. Um, also, another common thing, only one co-PI may be included in this application, yet you may have an unlimited number of collaborators. Um, as Margaret was talking about, collaboration for these grants is very, very important. Um, collaborating, any collaborator that's outside of the state of Texas may not receive secret funding. Uh, in the past couple of rounds, we've had lots of questions over the biosketches, the number of biosketches that could be included with an application and the page limits. We have increased the page limits to five pages for biosketches and for this RFA in particular because of the need for collaborators will allow up to five um, bio sketches for key personnel, which in the past it's only been two. So with that, we will open it up for questions. Um, oh, I'll go ahead and go over the, the timelines. We'll be releasing all the IRA RFAs as, long, as well as an early translational research award and a research training award. Those will be posted to the CPRIT website on February 19th of this year. The online application will open up on March 21st. Um, and those applications will be due May 20th. Uh, peer review will be take place during the summer, um, and the applications will be reviewed in person in September and October. We'll be awarding those at the November Oversight, Secret Oversight Committee meeting, and the anticipated start dates for these grants will be December 1st, 2016. So with that, we'll open it up to the audience for questions, as well as the people that are viewing on the webcast. Anybody on the webcast can send an email to this uh, email address, and I will be reading those questions out loud. Thank you. Comments, questions? Anybody have a comment about the money issue? <laughs> Everybody should have a con comment about the money issue. Yes, please. Yeah, I think it's uh, let me use your mic. Okay. I think we're closing. Pull it down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the validation experiments, I think it was sort of unfairly said in the, uh, in the RFA, right, with the limited budget that we couldn't propose follow-up experiments, but all three of my reviewers said they dinged it because there were no follow-up experiments. So maybe better educate the reviewers that, hey, there's not enough money to follow-up experiments, but now that you're proposing that we all do that, I think that's fantastic. I think that's, that's a really good idea. Okay, so, so, I strongly so support you think that, that will take care of the issue if we make such a... Yes. To increase the amount. Exactly, because previously there was no money to do any experiments. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, yes. So 50 applicants and one funded is kind of bad odds. 
Are they, going to, be any, are they going to be any better next go round? Well, I hope so, and of course that's why we're here today and why we're doing this. We're hoping to try to, to give people enough feedback so that they can improve their applications and resubmit. Um, it, it is a very low uh, percentage that um, even that went for discussion at the committee meeting. So I'm hoping that this will, that will inspire you to um, try again to um, try to address some of the criticisms and, and really try again. Is there a target for how many they would like to fund? I'm sorry? Is there a target number of how many they would like to fund or the maximum number that they would fund? What I can tell you is that typically for the individual investigator research awards, the funding success rate for those applications has historically been between 10 and 15%. But those, remember, those are, we get like 400 of those at a time. So I would hope that we would be able to, to fund 20%, 20 to 25% of the ones coming in. But they've got to pass the peer review system to be able to do that. So, so I'd like to um, talk about the review process. And sure. I thought that, first of all, we really appreciate you coming here and helping us, and I think that we are thankful to CIPRIT for funding computational biology. I think we all understand that enormous progress in cancer will come directly from computation. Um, this being said, looking at the reviews, um, I think that many of us have a lot of expertise putting together grants. Many of us hold grants from NIH mm -hmm. where we're scored in the low teens or even in single digits. Mm -hmm. Um, so, looking at the reviews uh, compared to our usual NIH reviews, I couldn't help but feel that there was a different standard apply. It seemed to me that my reviewers really, and of course I'm a jilted, I'm one of the 49 uh, people <laughs> who didn't get the grant. So. Um, a lot of the reviews were fairly made, you know, mountains out of intellectual molehills, and um, I thought I had jumped through all the hoops, and I certainly covered all the bases that you pointed out, and ended up with a score that was completely disproportionate to the kind of scores I usually get yeah. on NIH at NSF, at DARPA, and, and all of my six other federal grants. So I'm just, I'm just a little bewildered and, and, and disappointed by the entire process. And I think that while we always can up our game as applicants, and we have to and, and we will, um, I, just, I just wonder what happened at the review process that out of 50 highly competent experts in Texas, only one got funded. That seems... That seems just not quite right. Um, let me tell you something not quite relevant to your comment that might help. Um, when we first offered the multi-investigator research award, when Secret started up again, we, we changed many things in terms of the way the applications were submitted. And those also fared very poorly. We actually only funded two of those out of 45 applications. And um, I think that's not because we didn't have appropriate reviewers, but because, because we didn't give people an opportunity to put in all of the, the documentation that they needed. Um, we made some errors in, in um, I think, page limits for, for those applications, which we've tried to correct, and we are now um, reviewing the second round of those, which include a number, about half of them are resubmissions from the other round. So I am hoping that they will fare much better on the second round, uh, mainly because we've made a lot of changes. And, and again, there were, I think, some legitimate criticisms of those, but I think we have to share in the responsibility for the low, um, the low success rate of those applications as well as these. Um, so I think I'm hoping that the changes that we are talking about making will um, help in that regard. And um, uh, particularly, I think we've got to have more diverse expertise. I, I spoke extensively with some of the 
uh, reviewers that we had brought onto the review panels to, to do the reviews. And they, I think, were um, thought that we really needed more depth, more bench strength in that area. Um, there was also quite a, quite a big discussion about whether we should have a review panel specifically for computational biology as opposed to sending them to the uh, regular study sections and adding computational biology expertise. There was quite a diverse set of opinions about that. Um, I think I was persuaded by the people who said that we really want to make sure that the, the biology part is sound as well as the mathematical part being sound. So we'll try it again, keeping those in the regular review panels, but trying to really add a lot of expertise in, in that area. And I think that's probably what happened to a lot of people, is that, that um, we simply, making mountains out of molehills sounds to me like, like not the appropriate expertise to review the application. So I will urge you to try one more time. <laughs> Dr. Kripke, Dr. Winston has a question yes. for you. Yeah, first, Margaret, let me express the appreciation that I think we all feel uh, to CPRIT as an institution, to the legislature and all who've made this possible. Uh, as you well know, it's helped us to recruit very good people uh, to the state of Texas and to advance very much the research that goes on in the state. Uh, we also appreciate very much your role in this, and uh, we're sorry to lose you. Dr. Wilson is here, and I'm sure he's taking on the responsibilities in an appropriate way, uh, and will carry forward uh, your legacy in this regard. Uh, with respect to the critique, I think you've covered very well uh, the, uh, the issues. Uh, there is certainly a body of opinion that there should be a specialized review panel. Uh, I've received a number of comments to that effect. Uh, if there were a sufficient representation on the standard panels, and sufficient would mean more than a couple, uh, perhaps a fair fraction, uh, then perhaps that would receive, receive the same objective. I think we all know that it should not be just mathematicians, not just computational people. That would be an error in the opposite direction, but an adequate mix would certainly be good. Thanks. So we will depend on you for suggestions to, you know, really in, uh, increase the number of reviewers that we have so that we get a broader representation of areas that people here are interested in. So that would be very, extremely helpful for us. Yes, please. Yes, uh, I have a question regarding the amount of uh, preliminary data required since uh, in computation biology, um, we usually, we, we got a lot of hits. Um, and sometimes we can only do validation or do preliminary experiment on one of two targets. How much preliminary data are we expecting to do? Do we have to do some animal too? And, or we just have to do like at least five, ten different of them just to make sure we can convince the reviewers? Thanks. I, I, it's hard for me to answer that question because I'm not going to be one of the reviewers who's reviewing your application. I think you have to have enough to convince the reviewers that you that this is feasible. Mm -hmm. the, you know, it's a matter of of being able to demonstrate that the project is going to be feasible. Um, so, whatever I'm not sure how what that means in terms of anybody's specific project, but there has to be enough to make it clear that the project is doable as well as as uh, um, important when it's after, when it's done. If I can supplement, do we have to go um, extend the project all the way until like animal studies? No, no, I, I wouldn't think so. Yes, please. We have another question. Uh, here. Can you uh, uh, explain the review process more particular? I'm interested to know uh, um, what is the background of the reviewers. Okay, all of our reviewers are listed on our website, so you can go and look at who was on a particular review panel. So once the applications are assigned to a panel, the applicants are notified, you, you would be notified which panel you went to, and you'll be given an address to go to to find the names of all of the people who are on your panel. And so you can actually look and see who the people are and uh, look up what their expertise is. But we, you know, each panel is slightly different. Um, we have panels focused on 
different areas of cancer research. Um, and so if you want to know who is on a panel who reviewed a particular application, you can find that out. Uh, through the, the slides we just showed, uh, you, uh, there are comments like uh, lack of uh, biological uh, uh, interpreters like clinicians or cancer biologists. Um, uh, I mean, uh, in the ground, uh, if we put in uh, both bioinformatician and clinicians and uh, cancer biologists, uh, uh, there are already a, a lot of people there. Um, so how, um, how do we expect uh, uh, all these people allocated in right. the collaboration? Because right. uh, you said the, the, at, least, at the most one copy is allowed. Right. Right. I, I think you have to look at what the project is. If the project relates to clinical data, then your collaborator should be a clinician or someone who is experienced in that area. If your project has to do with uh, analysis of data from basic science, then you would want a, a basic scientist as a collaborator. So you don't have to have all of those people for every project, but you need one person who is relevant to what it is that you're trying to do. Is that clear? Does that make sense? We have also have some questions from the audience. You want to read those to me? First question is, um, can an application have both computational biology and, exp and experimental components? I don't see why not. I mean, it certainly wouldn't be prohibited um, if, if there's something that requires bench research or, or desk research in addition to a mathematical or computational biology component, um, that certainly wouldn't be prohibited in any way. Jim, do you have an opinion about that? I, I do. I think if the validation component is going to require the experimental component, as you mm -hmm. said, yes. What qualifies as a demonstration project that would be eligible for additional funding under this RFA? I'm going to let Jim answer that question, too. Can I put you on the spot for that? I haven't a clue. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about my answer to the previous, and so I didn't hear your the question. <laughs> what qualifies as a demonstration project under this RFA to be eligible for the additional funding? Well, I, th I think that in the context of our previous discussion, it is the experimental component of demonstrating the um, proof of principle, and the model would vary as to the subject matter, whether it's a, a basic question in a laboratory setting or an animal model. I think that's what we're discussing here in terms of the validation aspect. Yeah, so if you develop a model of some cellular pathway, um, you have a model, and now you want to validate the model and see how it relates to real life. So that undoubtedly would require doing some experimentation to see if results that come from the laboratory actually fit the, the uh, predictions of the model. This is kind of a long one. It's a statement and then a question. After reviewing the reviews, I ended up with the impression that some reviewers did not fully appreciate the contribution of computational modeling in general. This was reflected in comments regarding impact and cancer prevention diagnosis and treatment. The question is, how do you define impact for the purposes of this RFA, for example, of modeling, a model of signal, cellular signaling? Is there a criteria for assessment of impact explicitly shared by the reviewers? Well, impact means that you will make some progress. If it's a basic science project, uh, question or issue that's being looked at, I think there's pretty good, clear agreement among the reviewers that impact means that it will move the field forward in some way. For impact, if it's a more uh, clinical or translational uh, issue, impact means that it will have some kind of influence on cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment. 
So um, again, I'll go back to the example I gave earlier, the um, proposal to look at metastatic potential of cells in primary pancreatic cancers may have it may be a great model there may be a great model to do that but the impact would be very low because it's not a it's not a useful parameter to know in terms of predicting metastatic behavior okay so so i think the reviewers are pretty good when it comes to to impact on the disease and that's really what what i think everybody is looking for is something that will make a difference in terms of one of those parameters, prevention, uh, diagnosis, or treatment. The yes. next question is in three parts. Oh, dear. <laughs> Would it be possible to dedicate some funding for young investigators, i.e. untenured faculty? This may help significantly dealing, faculty dealing with computational biology to ex establish their research. It's very interesting. Every time we have one of these discussions, that question comes up. I am going to leave that to Dr. Wilson, my successor, <laughs> to uh, grapple with. Um, we have talked uh, with our uh, peer reviewers and also with the University Advisory Committee about the possibility of having um, awards specifically designated for uh, young investigators, junior investigators, whatever. We have not done that um, so far and have not had, a, I think, a compelling, sufficiently compelling reason to do so. Um, I know that the American Cancer Society only gives young investigator awards, and um, so that base is, is covered by that small funding agency. But we have not wanted to limit any of our awards to a specific um, group of people, with the exception of the recruitment awards, which are d targeted toward people at different career levels. So I don't have an answer for that particularly. Um, we do consider it about once a year, it gets brought up in discussion, and so far we haven't had a compelling enough reason to, to uh, do it. Can the co-PI be an experimentalist who is collaborating with a computational researcher? Absolutely. Yes. And based on the presentation, computational preliminary data are critical. How important is it to have experimental preliminary data supporting the computational preliminary data? No, well, that's, that's making you do the demonstration project before you get the money, I think. So, so I, I wouldn't think that should be required, but just enough uh, of the, you know, um, project, and the project has to be explained sufficiently so that the reviewers understand what is being done, what is being, what, what would be accomplished um, when the project is finished. But I don't think you can ask people to provide a demonstration that things are um, working or that, that, that the model actually applies to real life situation without first giving them the money to do the project. So, so you need some preliminary data, but I don't think you need a demonstration of proof of principle to, to be able to get funding. Anything else? On one of the slides, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I would like to share my gratitude and thanks for organizing, organizing this meeting. Um, my comment is when I saw the uh, reviewer um, comments, I was really encouraged and uh, very satisfied. The only comment I would like to make, so I'm not in the area of cancer or cancer biology, coming from genetics and developmental biology. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make a request that for the people they would like to, pars to participate or making a contribution to the cancer biology field, so the, there will be no expectation that these people will have a long history of publication or expertise in the cancer biology area, but they showed this or demonstrate that in another field. So kind of, it kind of a dichotomy to ask somebody who's tried to put his first uh, proposal to contribute to this field, but at the same time they requesting that one of the uh, weaknesses, oh, he's not an expert, although like you bring a uh, hmm. co-investigator who's supposed to be an expert, but still they don't consider him expert enough. So I'm, I'm not sure how you would. W was that a criticism? 
of, of your yes. application. So yeah, I, yeah, I saw a lot of comments, novel, yeah. innovative, yeah. exciting. Yeah. This is so amazing. But the weakness, oh, he's not an expert. So oh, how would you solve this? Well, uh, again, I think it's a matter of, of having appropriate reviewers who understand the situation. Also, um, we could do a better job of educating our reviewers um, to, to understand that we are trying to encourage people to get into cancer, even if they haven't done work in cancer research previously. Uh, that has happened to us before when we've, we've tried to, to um, put out RFAs encouraging people to work in, ca in cancer who maybe haven't done it before, and the reviewers you know, somehow seize upon that as a criticism if you don't have a track record in that area. It's unfortunate, it happens, we'll try to educate people to, to address that issue. Dr. Krepke, we have two more hands that were up, please. Yes. So you mentioned on one of the slides that um, collaborator effort was not, you know, specified. Uh, should I interpret that to mean that if the collaborator is in Texas, they must be funded with a defined level of effort? And what about collaborators from outside the state of Texas who cannot be funded? I don't think you have to have a specific level of effort, although that would be helpful. If it's possible, you should do it. Um, but I think the most important thing is to clearly define what is the role of this person? What are they going to do? Um, in some cases, if you just put in a bio sketch for somebody and don't say anything about what the person is going to do, you know, that they're, they're going to help with the application, they're going to give advice about this or that, they're going to meet with you periodically, and they're going to have a graduate, your graduate student in their lab to learn how to do, you know, some of the biological things. Those are things I think that are really important rather than level of effort. Yeah, so it's understanding what the role of those people is in your, uh, in your application. I think we had a hand in the back, please, yeah. yes. If you could press the microphone, please, so people can hear your question. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry for being late. So uh, I'm not sure this question has been asked. So my question is that, so the focus of this RFA is on computational biology. How about the computational chemistry, for example, computational drug discovery? So to focus on like uh, use the modeling approach to uh, optimize the drugs and to design, rationally design small molecules for cancer therapeutics uh, and treatment. Oh, I think that should probably be, could probably be included. Um, I, have to, I have to ask experts about that. I'm, I'm not sure. Wait, leave me your name and information and let me see how, how broadly interpreted the computational biology can be. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. You may you, also... You um, send an email to this email address and, oh, yeah. and we'll get that. Yeah, It'll send, us, send us an email there and then we'll be able to get you some information. And we have a follow-up question, please. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, please. How can we suggest the reviewer? Should we just send an email? Yeah. Send it directly to that uh, email address. That would be just really helpful. Okay. Yeah, yes, please. please. So, I mean, I guess the kind of enviable position that we've done the wet work, we've done the modeling, we have a whole bunch of ideas based on the wet work for more modeling and for the more, from the modeling for more wet work. And so I can envision a grant that's, you know, 50-50 comp and wet work. Is that within the scope of this, to have that much wet work in it? Uh, you're asking me really tough questions today. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, because essentially it's application of the, the computational aspect to hypothesis developing and then testing hypotheses, right? As long as you have some, some of the mathematical stuff in it, if it's all wet work, it's not going to, obviously wouldn't, wouldn't go. But, you know, 50-50 probably would, would survive that, yes. I'm thinking that there'd be a lot of math work, but that the more expensive work is the wet work. Yeah, okay. And so, you know, in terms of work effort, heavy in math, yeah. but in terms of dollars spent, heavy in, right. heavier probably in wet. Um, there's also, I should um, tell you, there's also one other caveat put in the RFA, which says that, that the limits, the 150 
thousand a year for three years and whatever, that if you can make a really strong justification, you can ask for more. So that might be a situation where you would need to ask for more to be able to do the wet work uh, to go along with some of the uh, mathematics. But the, the reviewers um, think that the secret grants are pretty generous to begin with compared to what they're you know, scratching out in their own institutions. And so you have to be careful not to ask for too much money, otherwise they, you know, they're not very sympathetic. So just with that caveat. But you, you can, if you have a good justification, you can ask for, mon for more outside that limit. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think more there's hands. one question from online. Um, is there any particular area of computational biology that this program is more interested in funding? Uh, the research area, er, my research area is not in your list. My research area is molecular dynamics and molecular mechanism studies, computer-aided cancer drug discovery. Would this be eligible? Yes, that would be perfectly fine. The, the list is not comprehensive. It was meant to provide some examples, not to be an exhaustive, exhaustive list. We have another question, please. Hi, uh, thank you for this meeting uh, and all the information we have to improve our uh, application. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I'm leaving the institution I was working in when I present last May, and uh, um, I still want to, to collaborate with my former colleague on, on this. So two institutions can, can, can work together to a CIPWIT or, or the I mean, the collaborators need to be in the same institution, or they can, no. No. no, there is no. No, they can they can be in two different institutions, but there can only be one principal investigator. Yeah, one PI. So one institution is the lead institution, but you can um, there can be a subcontract to the other institution for the other investigator. So you can collaborate. You can can uh, work together on that, and you can and as long as you're in Texas, you can both spend money, right? Yeah, but, but um, yeah, and the copy I needs to present only only one separate or um, there was a limitation about the number of. Uh, there can be one copi per grant, but a copi can serve in more than one grant. So a person can be if there are two computational biology grants submitted, an individual can serve as copi in both of those grants. They just need to make sure that they have uh, appropriate time and effort to be able to to do a good job in both. And if he applies to another grant of CIPWIT outside of the computational biology, what applies? That's, That's fine. fine. If they fine. apply for childhood and adolescent cancer or untargeted, uh, untargeted or IRAP, that's, that's, fine. that's fine. A PI Thank just you. cannot have any more than three separate grants of any type that are active December 1st of 2016. But in this next cycle, they can only apply for one IIRA. Right. You Regardless can only, of whether it's just a general IRA or a computational biology right. or, or whichever one. Exactly. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, we need to ask Dr. Rice. Are you still on the phone, Dr. Rice? I sure am. Would you like to make some comments or answer any of the questions that we couldn't answer? Thank you for asking. But no, I think um, it's, it's been a great meeting. And um, I love all the answers um, and all the questions. Um, and I'm very thankful for your time and effort and for those that are attending to um, be asking questions and to be attentive to this topic. So, so thanks to you all. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So Appreciate your being I, here. Just as a I think final. There was, did you have a question? Oh. I think there was yeah. a final question. <coughs> Can you use your microphone, please? Okay. So my question is if the PI is uh, a uh, uh, co-investigator on another three uh, C program. Um, uh, is, is he or she still qualified for the grant? No. No? no it's, you, it's PI. You it's have being to be a PI. PI on three grants. Oh, OK. Yeah. Before we uh, end our meeting, I just wanted to take a, a moment to say uh, sincere thanks to our guests for being here today, answering our questions. Thanks to the audience who are present here for very thoughtful questions and those online. It's also an occasion for us to personally thank Dr. Kripke for her service 
it's a remarkable fact that the citizens of Texas have made these funds available because our leadership in the state of Texas has decided that this is the path to take. But there are people here who have served us, and we just want to say thank you to you, Dr. Kripke, Michael, Michael Brown, thank you, Wayne Roberts, thank you, and uh, especially best wishes to Dr. Wilson, Jim, thank you so much for being here today, and uh, thank you all for attending the session, thank you. And a reminder to everyone, to everyone here and watching online, uh, you can send an email to this email address at any point um, from here forward, and we'll be checking that box. Thanks.